Okay, we probably not to do that to you, Chance. What? I told him it was like a microwave and he told me that we should set you to popcorn. Please go. I'm here at Cognitive FX in Provo, Utah this week to try and fix the concussion I've had for the past six months. And one of their big tools is their MRI machine. We're gonna try it out. I'm gonna get to sit at the console. Chance saw the video of me saying that I had the concussion and reached out and said, hey, we're the perfect solution. You should come check us out. So we're gonna make you the guinea pig. So we've got Tanner here, who's the MRI tech. You're gonna show me how to work the controls. We'll show you the ropes. We need to pull all the metal off, right? right? So giant magnet in there, really scary and dangerous. If anything metal goes past the doorway, it can fly towards the machine and wreck all sorts of havoc. Let's switch Chance for some scrub bottoms. You wanna do that on camera? Yeah, uh, no thank you. <laughs> Give us a minute. Chance wears glasses. Okay. Glasses, you can't take them into an MRI because you've got metal screws and lots of metal parts. So this is a specialty set of oh. meta goggles. Oh, I like, <laughs> I like the Comic Sans font. Very expensive for Comic Sans. This screw you'll notice is actually oh, plastic. And then these lenses are actually different powers so that we can build glasses for patient X5. got some pretty wild ones All here. Way, you gotta be smudging. pretty dang blind yeah, to need these for guys. Like, look at that thing. Uh, first one P, the next one's LP. Stylish. Yeah. Hey, we'll get you in there, my friend. Dang, a couple safety checks, pockets, jewelry, zippers, wristbands, you're good. Chance, you can leave your mask just here. So you can walk all the way up to the metal frame. All the way frame up to here. the metal frame, just don't go past it. Or else you won't keep your camera. <laughs> your plug for you, sir. This is a super loud machine. Remind me, I think I know where the noise comes from. It's from the coils of the machine right. slapping together yep. as they energize the energize. Correct. So two major parts of the MRI. The big circle tube is actually the MRI coil that generates the magnetic field. So if you could see the magnetic lines that you're shooting out, wrapping around the machine, wrapping back in and around behind the machine, just like a giant electromagnet. Then down in the lower side of the machine, you've got gradient coils that are generating, here, let me pull this guy off. So gradient coils that are generating radio frequency pulses. So how an MRI works is the giant magnet lines up all the water molecules in your body. And then the gradient coils are pulsating knocking them off course, and then recording how fast and how strongly they knock back into a line. The gradient coils, lots of power going through them, expanding, contracting, making them very, very really, quickly. really quickly. Like, so for example, when we're taking his fMRI images, we're actually taking images of a whole brain, 24 slices, in about two or three seconds. So it's, and that's why it sounds really horrible. So this one, giant squeeze ball, this one is the emergency let me out ball. <laughs> so you'll notice this is pneumatic tubing. Nothing even metal on the connector here. It actually just runs in through pneumatic tubing. It runs all the way into that room. You squeeze it. I'm gonna turn that guy off so it doesn't break okay. nuts. Great, yeah. <laughs> So we wouldn't be able to hear him in there at all while the machine is running, and we can't even hear him through this speaker that we'll show you here in a minute. So we have to have that loud emergency squeeze ball so that we can know to go in and get him out. This one, the button box, again, pneumatic tubing, where this is actually just registering the pressure of these buttons being pressed. So I did a bit of research, and this thing is called an FORP, or a fiber optic response pad, and the buttons actually intercept the path of light from a strand of fiber optics, one per button. And it's crazy expensive, it's like $4,000. But the company that makes this makes a bunch of MRI safe devices, including a steering wheel. And so the reason we're using this is, let's discuss the next piece. This is to okay. give answers right. to a quiz right. that you're being given via another very cool piece of technology. Because again, yep. you can't just put a computer screen over your brain. Right. Okay. If we scoot out around here, we'll look through here. We'll actually look right past Chance there, and if you look right through that, you can actually see that TV screen right at the back of the room. It's actually an MRI safe TV screen. I don't actually know how it works. Crazy expensive though, again, about $10,000. Oh my God. Yeah. You're gonna have a hard time seeing that because you're looking at the ceiling, right? Right. So let's show you how that works. Yep. So this guy is a head coil for an MRI, and your head just goes right in the center of it. These arms around the outside are actually gradient coils that are putting off their own radio frequency. No as way! Well. I thought this was yep. just for holding you still. Nope, it does hold you still too, but it's actually a necessary part of the machinery. If you look at this guy, it feels like you're plugging in like a nuclear power plant. So does the machine actually energize these yep. coils? So the machine energizes these coils no and then is transmitting in this coil and receiving in yeah. coils in the actual machine. Typically, right, this whole apparatus wouldn't be here if you were doing a normal brain MRI. We want you to be able to see that TV screen at the end. Yeah. So you've got mirrors here that you're actually looking at this mirror at the top, which is bouncing the image off of this mirror here, and, and then viewing the image out the back. Now the tape 
It looks super redneck. <laughs> it's not together. great. The tricky thing is that for a GE MRI, they actually only manufacture this to point forward. We wanted to use the TV the other end, so we had to literally flip it and tape it. So let's go put awesome. this on chain. Yeah, for let's a get loaded up. So let's get his head coil on here. You're not gonna fit. I love it. So giant plug, plugs into that guy. Okay, we'll get some padding in here by your ears. So typically for a brain MRI, we want you to be really, really still, right? Because we're taking lots of pictures really quickly and we don't want the pictures to smudge. So we put not one, but two giant pads on that side. How big it gets? Huh? <laughs> Your earplugs have expanded, haven't they? Yes. It normally takes a minute and I can talk a little quieter. <laughs> so the machine that's interesting actually needs to know where he's at in physical space. Yep. So we turn on this handy dandy crosshair laser. Oh, nice. We're actually looking to put that directly over a line on this head coil that tells the machine where his brain is. Because we want the machine to know where he is in physical space, and we want it to be dead center in the machine so that he's experiencing as much of the magnetic field as possible. So we'll slide him back just a little bit. Close your eyes. And then we'll actually hit the zeroing button. This is like zeroing out a CNC machine or a 3D yep. printer. Exactly the same. You've got your DRO up here. Yep. <laughs> exactly the same. Hey, your elbows are touching the sides just a bit, so let's get some pads in there for you. We actually don't want any of your extremities to be touching the sides of the walls. Right hand there, other hand here. So with the gradient coils, it's actually passing radio frequency through your body enough that you can start to heat up on your elbows. Wow. One of the other big reasons that we don't want you to have metal and that we actually have several protocols on there that keep us not scanning too quickly on certain scan sequences because if we're pumping too full of that radio frequency, things can start to get warm. Wow, yeah, you start to cook people like a yeah, microwave. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we promise not right. to do that to you, Chance. What? And I told him it was like a microwave, and he told me that we should set you to popcorn. Please go. <laughs> hey, well, let's show you how this guy works. This is just the control for the MRI technician. And down here, you've got your MRI computer, but that is not the whole computer. This is basically a glorified desktop that just records what's going on here and sends it to the main MRI computer in the back. All right, Chance, I'm going to go ahead and run a couple of localizer scans here for you. Go ahead and hang tight and you'll hear some scanning noise, okay? Sure. So right now, the only thing the machine has loaded in is where that center point is on his head. So we'll let's scan and run what's called a localizer scan. A localizer scan is a very small amount of images in not very good image quality just to see where the heck his head even is. So that we could figure out what area are we actually going to run right. a more detailed scan on. Right. So if we look over at this guy over here, these are the localizer scans that we just did at Chance's head. There's like 20 of them. That's pretty high detail though. It's I not, thought it was gonna be much terrible. worse. It's not not bad. Yeah. You get quite a bit of good detail, but then you have to really ramp up the time and the scanning frequencies to yeah, get to get stuff that's actually detail. usable, yeah. So we do what's called the 3D calibration. We're choosing a point here. This one is calibrating the gradients. So this is basically setting contrast. Yep, so it's gonna oh, run this really loud, high-pitched, gross scan, and then these images look like gobbledygook. But so, you're dragging this around to set where you're gonna scan. So if you look oh, down in here, it's these cool. 24 slices at a slice thickness of five millimeters. We're essentially that's setting awesome. what our voxel size is going to be. It's basically so it's like a, a pixel 3D size. pixel. Now, these guys were dragging where to put those slices so that we can get the best scan coverage. And then we'll run what's called a prep scan. So it's a lower res version of that, and then it'll actually run the exact sequence to make sure that the machine can run the sequence. So you'll hear this like beep, 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 just like that. All right, Chance, do you remember that first test? Yes. You guys have some proprietary Correct. tests, some problem solving, some memory type stuff, that sort of thing. Right. But you guys have worked very hard to develop that. You're not quite ready to share that right. with the world. So, so, so couple, we're gonna keep this off we'll camera keep here. That pointed that way. Yeah. Chance, we're gonna talk a little more, so we'll be back in a moment, okay? Okay. Keep him, on, keep him on ice in there. So fMRI is just the protocol to gather functional imaging. It doesn't refer to anything that you're doing. The, the thing that is special about our system, why it's called functional neurocognitive imaging rather than functional magnetic resonance imaging, is the tasks. Right. So you might have had in your course of concussion recovery, like a neuropsychological testing battery, that are tests to see what your brain is doing, when it's doing it, how fast it's doing it, how much is it doing. And those tests are all entirely based on performance. What these are is tests that have been adapted for use in the fMRI that are well suited to detect the areas that have experienced damage from a concussion. And it's less about what you answer and right. more about what is the brain doing while you're trying to answer. Right. 
that's one of the tricky things with concussion. You, you've got mild TBI all the way up to severe TBI. Severe TBI, like you can't walk, you can't eat, you need to like yeah. learn how to do stuff. Mild TBI, there's this really broad spectrum of you can perform, but you're wiped out afterward, or you can't do this, but you can do this. It's this like squishy space yeah. where neuropsych tests really have a very hard time figuring it out because you might perform great, but then afterwards they're feeling like horrible yeah, off the bat. That's right. the kind of stuff that I've been dealing with. What this does is uncouples your performance on the test, which we don't actually care about. We care far more about what's actually happening in the brain when that's going on. So let's go ahead and start him on this guy and then yeah. we'll chat while he's scanning. All right, Chance, let's go ahead and check your button box. Can you press one, two, three, and four for me? So it'll light up here. Are you ready to start? Yes. Okay, let's do it. MRI is not well suited to sync up with other tests. Yeah. We literally just have to hit the buttons at the same time. <laughs> and rough. <laughs> Things. If it works. If it works, it works. So you don't get to see much in real time. You know that you're getting images. You get to see images. They come through as they're processed. Ah. So you'll see kind of a stack come through. Then what we're doing is actually looking at some rest periods and some active periods on that test and sort of compiling all of those images into a 3D model, laying that over his actual structural brain for accuracy and then comparing the blood flow activation patterns of his brain to a normal, healthy, standardized population. Got it. So again, looking over here, essentially what we're seeing with the brightness, right, is not only the structure of the brain, but how much blood flow is being distributed in that part of the brain. So what we're getting is, it's called the bold signal, and it's the ratio of oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin. And oxygenated blood shows up brighter than deoxygenated? Right. Right. So essentially a, a brain area that's using more blood flow is going to have more deoxygenated blood and then it's going to have more oxygen blood flowing into it. So we're, we're, there's a, a postulate in neuroscience that we, we aren't actually looking at directly at neuronal activity, which for our purposes is great because your neurons are still working, they're still alive, they're still connected, but they're not getting the blood flow that they need. All right, Chance, just checking in with you after that one. Everything's still going okay? Yes. Okay, very good. All right, we're gonna go ahead and finish that one and then we'll do that brain MRI and show these guys what that looks like, okay? Okay. So we're gonna set him up on this first one. And this so, is for the structural. Right. So this is, no, we're no longer looking at where blood is flowing. Right. We're just looking at where is there tissue in the brain. Is tissue in the right place? Is it the right shape? Is it the right size? Is there evidence of brain bleeds? Those kinds of Got it. Things. This one is the MRI that if you went to any MRI facility, you're gonna get a structural right. scan. Right, and so what? What's the output of this process to, that goes, goes so on to the next step? So output of this, if we look at Chance's scan here, you'll notice that there's 2,024 images. Yep. Those are DICOM images. You can convert them to JPEG, but you really don't want to because they're stupid huge and yep. large. And those are just flat 2D images, yep. but it's in a, in a set that's right. basically a stack up. So cool. it, it's essentially building a full 3D model of your brain's blood flow. What our analysis software is doing is looking at all of those put together, compiled together, and then comparing against yep. other people. So we've got Chance's images back. You can actually see, we're gonna start at the top of his head and it'll actually scroll down in much more oh, wow. fine slices all the way down through the brain. That's you can start to see wild. his eyeballs in there. Yeah. You can actually convert and then 3D print a model of your brain. Nice, I might I do had that. A, I had a, a research lab once that that was their shtick is that they would print you a 3D model of their brain and then they would just print the same 3D model of a brain for everyone. <laughs> This is your brain. That's it's terrible. like, hey, this is not your brain. This is that's some, this is some Atlas. And that's the way brain. they got volunteers. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's awful. Well, let's go get Chance out of there. I'm, I'm sure he's dying. We've been filming here for a half hour, 45 minutes. Probably. Yeah. You doing okay in there? Oh, he can't hear us. He's got his earplugs in. I think you're done. It's okay, not so. microwaves, yeah, I promise. Okay. No one has ever been cooked in an MRI. Yeah, no. I did read a theoretical math problem once about what it would take to cook a chicken in an MRI. Oh, yeah. It would take about four or five hours. And some weird tinglys. So the weird tinglys, this is actually kind of fun. Oh, um, is this a thing? It is. It is called peripheral nerve stimulation because you likely had your hands folded or your legs crossed or something touching somewhere. If you create a loop, the radio frequencies will actually travel in that room. Oh, like an antenna. Like an antenna. Holy so it'll cow. actually hit your muscles and cause them to twitch. Okay, you're gonna hop up, my friend. Let's Thank you for being so patient with us. Yeah, of course. How do you feel? I feel tingly. Is it just in your arms? 
Well, I felt it in, like my fingertips. They were yep. like full, full like this. Oh yeah, you built vibration. a good solid loop. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Your your small muscles are where you fill it the most because it doesn't take much electricity to get them to turn. At the... Let's show you the back room. Yes. So. Oh wow! Back in the day, this is like a proper server room. This was full, totally full, full up of just computers. Moore's law in action. Here. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so let's see what you got left. So what we've got left is this. This has become a, a storage room in here, I can see. Yep. An extremely large air conditioner. Wow. Because before we had to keep a whole crap ton of computers cool. Yep. So this is our actual MRI computer. So it's the part that's bringing in all of that signal, analyzing yep. it, and then spitting out the images. That's so it shrank amazing. from the size of a small room to this. This one is part of our helium circulator. Our helium is actually in liquid form circulating in the magnet to keep it cold while it's running. It's part of what helps it to maintain that electrical circuitry of the electromagnet. And then this one is pumping that helium. So it's pumping in, pumping out. You can hear kind of that chirping sound. And if you have to vent your helium, that's kind of a big deal. <laughs> Let's walk out there and we'll tell you about it. We obviously have warning signs literally everywhere. And we have really yeah. strict screening protocols. Let's say somebody goes in with metal, right? If it's small metal, typically it'll just fly off and stick to the magnet. Yeah. It's happened once or twice with like a bobby pin, right? If it's large metal, like a desk chair or heaven forbid, an oxygen tank or fire extinguisher, you're screwed. <laughs> yeah. Because what it will actually do, and you can, you can look up videos on YouTube, but it will pull it into the magnet and then it will shoot it and shoot it and shoot it and shoot oh. it along the magnetic line. It will yeah. be shooting it through anything and everyone that's in its way. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> bad, bad, bad vibes. Yeah. That's a bad day at the office. Now there's no off button for the magnet. We can turn off the coils. We can turn off the console. The magnet is literally always on, always, yep. always, always. So in case of absolute life or limb emergencies, we can do what's called a quench. What a quench does is actually shoot all of that liquid helium converts it into gas helium and shoots it out through the roof. The magnet gets too hot, it dissipates and is totally fine. Now, and does that ruin the magnet? It causes like $500,000 worth of damage. It's really catastrophic and a hidden button and there's some manual switches and I can't show you any of those for legal reasons. You push the button and within five to 10 seconds, your magnet's gone. Now that's if somebody's trapped or pinned or in dire, dire circumstances. So you never want to quench a magnet. And most magnets never ever even need to be quenched because again, we put layered safety protocols in place to make sure that nothing can go wrong. Well, let's hope you never have to do that. Never have, hope to never, yeah. ever, ever have to do that. Fingers crossed. So that's our MRI. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for You're taking welcome. the time to show us this. This is amazing. It's it's really cool to see how this works on a hands-on basis. Yeah. It's, it's stuff that you never get to see because usually you're in the tube and we're out here running it and getting the images and then just yeah. showing you a report. Thank you for not only being our test patient here and letting us skin your brain, but also for hooking this up in the first place. I'm, I'm so grateful that you reached out when I said I had a concussion in, in my last video. And you guys have been really generous in exchanging some of the, the treatment here in return for uh, telling some stories. I'm really excited to go back home with all of the results of all my scans and watch the improvements over the next few months. Yeah, I'm super glad you don't just hide it behind a, a, a curtain, but you let people know. And because you were able to do that, I could reach out to you and we could get this information to not just you, but yeah. other people who could be dealing with just exactly what you're yeah. dealing with. How should people get a hold of you if they're suffering from long-term concussion symptoms? So we have a consultation button on our website that if anybody wants to get a consultation with our clinic, they can definitely reach out to us in that way. We also have a phone number on our website that people can call if they have any questions as well. And honestly, that anybody that has been through our treatment loves talking about their treatment. CognitiveFX.com, is that the website? It's CognitiveFXUSA.com. In addition, if like me, you're suffering from headaches from a head injury, check out their online course on how to manage headaches. Use offer code STRANGEPARTS10 for 10% off at the link down in the description. And if you'd just like to learn more about concussions, recovering from them, and all the cool technology involved, I recorded several really interesting conversations with the neuroscientists that run Cognitive FX, which I put up on my second channel, Stranger Parts. You can find a link to those in the description down below as well. And stay tuned for more videos. I've been setting up my new shop here in Colorado for the past six months, and I've been putting together a video of that whole process. And I'm finally feeling well enough to start making videos regularly again. I'll see you again soon.